Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the JLF at the British Library Knowledge Centre Theatre. We are delighted to introduce this session, The Woodhouse Effect, Why India Loves Jeeves. Um, please ensure that your phones are on silent and there's no flash photography allowed in the venue, I'm afraid. Um, please welcome Shashi Thoreau, Swapan Das Gupta, Tony Ring and Mihir Sharma. Uh, thank you uh, for turning up um, and uh, foregoing the pleasure of, of a session about partition in, to sit instead in what will no doubt be a very tiresome session on P.J. Woodhouse. Uh, those are, of course, the only two options for South, South Asia, war or Woodhouse. And so, therefore, I'm very glad that you've picked the correct one. Um, I wanted to, in fact, uh, sort of start uh, uh, the short introduction and... Um, and in fact, with a story that uh, comes from a collection of Woodhouse, uh, of Woodhouse, his own uh, work, in which he, um, let me see if I can bring it up, um, in which he uh, writes uh, uh, in, in response, in, in over 70, uh, one of his collections of, uh, of his own work, um, in response to, I think, a letter writer um, to the Times, who uh, signed indignant, um, in which um, indignant declared that Woodhouse was a tremendously um, over overrated writer, and uh, um, therefore, uh, you know, people should not make a big deal out of him. And the response um, that uh, Woodhouse had to this was um, it's quite delightful. He he said that um, I would like to point out that um, indignant's opinion is not universally shared. In fact, there was a letter, I have a clipping from the Times, um, in which a letter has been sent in from a Mr. Verrier Elwin in India, um, uh, declaring that a cow came onto his veranda, and uh, from a shelf that contained, among others, the works of Goldsworthy and you know, Henry James and whatnot, chose a copy of Leave It to Smith to eat. <laughs> And what greater possible uh, compliment could there be? And I feel that in today's India in particular, be chosen by a cow, of course, is uh, <laughs> the highest form of approbation. So, um, but anyway, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a mark of, uh, of Woodhouse's um, impact on India that you know, this letter was written. I mean, we all know that Verrier Elwin was probably one of our leading uh, uh, sociologists and anthropologists and students of tribal life, and his... Um, his own diary, Elwin's own diary, in fact, uh, uh, of his life in the, in the Indian forest called um, Leaves from the Jungle, um, has been described by no less an authority uh, on uh, St. Stephen's College, um, Elwin and Woodhouse, as Ram Guha, as being Woodhouseian. <laughs> All right, so, um, so the question then arises, so what, what, what is it about P.G. Woodhouse? Why is it that he um, appeals to uh, 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 people in India so much? Um, I'm, I'm not certain what, and we're going to turn to the panel in a moment to ask, but is it his use of language? Does it appeal to sort of the bilingual within us that uh, Woodhouse manages to be so incredibly creative? He, he treats English almost like a foreign language. He plays with it in a way um, that I think most native-born English writers uh, uh, found um, extraordinary. Um, is it perhaps that he is disconnected from, the real, uh, from reality in some way, that he lives in this, you know, his books are written in this sort of uh, fantasy Edwardian England where, you know, full of um, terrifying aunts. I have a terrifying aunt somewhere in this room uh, as well. Um, and um, terrifying aunts and, and overbearing butlers and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, and so therefore, for Indians, it is, it's not a matter of having to know England. It's a matter of getting to know this sub-created world. It's like science fiction. Um, or is it the fact that, as Malcolm Margarish said, and Shashi quoted in one of his great pieces on Woodhouse, that um, India is the last refuge of the Englishman, um, <laughs> and of a particular sort of Englishman. No, none, of those, none of these people are on this panel. Um, and, um, or is it something else? Is it the fact that we can instinctively understand the sort of class-ridden society that he writes about, and that we can put it at a distance from ourselves and not have it bother us and nevertheless enjoy it. Some of the most uh, people who've enjoyed Woodhouse the most that I've known 
have been uh, died in the wool Marxists, for example. I was, in, I was in, gra in graduate school at a place called the Indian Statistical Institute, which had 40 other graduate students, 39 of whom were Bengali and 38 of whom were uh, uh, members of the SFI. <laughs> and um, not one of them had read Marx, but every single one of them had read Leave it to Smith. <laughs> All right? Um, and, and they loved it even more so uh, uh, than, they, than, than they did ideology or dogma. So th there's something about it. Um, and to sort of discuss these questions, we have a very fun and interesting panel. To, de to demonstrate the importance of what else to India, we have arranged for not one, but two members of parliament. Um, and um, so we have Shapan Das Gupta, who is a member of the Rajya Sabha, and um, writes um, possibly three columns a week for three different people. Am I wrong? No, you're right. Um, and, uh, and is uh, perilously close to being a public intellectual, though I, I dare say that um, <laughs> he would probably throw that glass at me if, if I actually claimed he was. Um, we have Tony Ring, who's the president of the Woodhouse uh, Society, which he, um, in fact, refounded in some sense in 1997. Uh, and um, has thousands of members all across the world and is extremely active and um, has also published an enormous multi-volume concordance of Woodhouse's works, which is uh, exactly appropriate because you should, in fact, treat the collected works of Woodhouse like you would the Bible. Um, and finally, we have Shashi Tharoor, um, who is, as everyone knows, a stalwart of anti-imperialist politics and um, a writer of, a writer of uh, dozens and dozens of books, and uh, not so incidentally, a member of parliament for Trivandrum. Uh, which uh, seat he held on to in the teeth of the Modi wave in 2014. So he is um, an as accomplished a politician as he is a public speaker, and since he's a very good public speaker. Um, and the way that we're going to do this is that I'll ask all of them to, uh, for their thoughts, um, uh, and I'll um, try and cut them off if they, if they go on too long. But, um, and then we will make the discussion general. Tony, why don't you start? Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to everybody. A little bit of context. Uh, Woodhouse was born in 1881, a third son, and he, during his childhood, his parents were absent nearly all the time. His father was a magistrate in Hong Kong, came back uh, to the UK after uh, suffering severe illness while Woodhouse was at Dulwich College. Th that meant that the, there was no money for, uh, for Woodhouse to follow his elder brother to university, so he got a job at the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank. Uh, writing in his spare time, but sitting on a desk uh, at a bank um, did not appeal to him. He spent two years there and then resigned and became a full-time writer. He was now in his 20s. He was writing school stories in his spare time, getting them published uh, in magazines as well as in books. But he was also earning his living as a journalist, writing essays and short articles on topical subjects for a variety of daily, weekly, and monthly magazines. And they included a lot of poems. And these poems had themes which occur today and would be familiar to educated middle classes in every country. Um, this was a verse from a, a, a poem in 1906. But when a royal couple woo, it can't be done in private, for thousands rally round to view if they can but contrive it. With cameras behind the trees, reporters cut their capers. He gives her hand a gentle squeeze. Next day, it's in the papers. <laughs> now, that's over 100 years ago. Nothing changes, as you can tell. Uh, when he was in his 30s, he was in America. And in America, he was continuing to write his fiction in novel form and in serial form. But he also became the leading lyric writer in American musical comedy. This year, 2017, is the centenary of the occasion when, in November, he had five new shows on Broadway simultaneously. It's a record which has never been uh, uh, matched as far as anyone can find out. The Sunday Times attempted recently and could only come to four. <laughs> in many ways, this experience in, the, in, the, in his 30s was the most important training for his fiction. He was to say that his books were musical comedies without the music. And it wasn't just the UK and America that were attracted to it straight away. The first Dutch translation uh, was known to be in a magazine in 1904. The first translated novel was in Germany in 1917. 
he was banned in Russia in the 1920s. And so he was starting to develop an international following, and that's continued ever since. I have got 750 different translations of his books at home, nowhere near the number that have been published. And I regret to say that there is only one that I'm aware of in an Indian language. It is Telugu, one of the most widely spoken. <laughs> he clearly intended to deal with everyday subjects, uh, which those from other countries, as well as the UK and US, would understand. His writing concentrated on experiences, exaggerated, but experiences which had a little angst, limited philosophical rev revelations. Those that he did have were restricted to simple tenets, which could be explained in an unexpected but humorous manner. My favourite? That's the way to get on in the world, by grabbing your opportunities. Why, what's Big Ben but a wristwatch that saw its chance and made good? <laughs> He kept extensive notes of his personal experiences and of incidents he'd read or was told about, and he saved them for later, for use. In 1908, he was in his 20s, still working as a journalist, made many contributions to the magazine Titbits. In 1910, he had a novel serialised in it. And at that time, Titbits offered a sort of insurance policy for subscribers. If you had an accident while you were carrying an issue, it would pay out so much for a broken limb so much for a stay in hospital, and so much for a death. And now, you may recognise the bones of a Eukridge story from 1923, when the star character arranged for a syndicate to buy subscriptions to several journal, uh, journals which had similar offers. And they held a sweepstake to decide which member of the syndicate <laughs> would deliberately have an accident. And there have been a number of court cases in the UK in recent years involving very similar insurance frauds. Woodhouse's essential sympathy for the underdog comes through in all his books. He's often portrayed as writing stories featuring well-to-do, upper-class heroes or silly asses, gormless or overbearing heroines. But while that generalisation has an element of truth, it's clear to anyone who reads more than one or two that it is a gross simplification. Which type of character always comes off worst? It's the judge, the magistrate, the officious lawyer, the mean millionaire, the ruthless businessman, the overbearing aunt, the wealthy peer, the politician, the policeman. In summary, those in authority. Who come off best? Well, it's the penniless nephew or niece, the servant, the young lovers, the independent woman making her way. In summary, the characters that our instincts tell us that we should sympathise with. A couple of examples. Some policemen are born grafters, some achieve graft, and some have graft, graft thrust upon them. <laughs> Judges, as a class, display in the manner of arranging alimony that reckless generosity which is only found in men who are giving away someone else's cash. <laughs> and then there's one showing how girls in their early 20s might really think about men as a species. Chumps always make the best husbands. When you marry, Sally, grab a chump. All the unhappy marriages come from the husband having brains. What good are brains to a man? They only unsettle him. <laughs> now, turning to specific matters of relevance to India, the educated middle or upper class Indian family was likely to speak English and a good proportion could read it. But books were expensive and so were handed down from generation to generation within families. Children would often start reading Woodhouse and Christie out of necessity. Until quite late in the last century, access to news media and by today's standards the rudimentary visual coverage of current events meant that Woodhouse stories didn't really seem to date. Of course, over time, the second and third generation of English-speaking Indian has written brilliant books of his or her own, offering severe competition to both living and dead writers from the UK and the USA. The first example I read was Vikram Seth's 1993 masterpiece, A Suitable Boy, incidentally with characters reading Woodhouse for comfort. <laughs> that was broadly around the time that Indians started to travel the world, for which a command of English offered huge benefits and flexibility of options. And Woodhouse's characters and settings were accessible. The nature of family life in the UK was not dissimilar to that in a relevant English family who would have servants, Indians had 
aunts, they had uncles, they had big families uh, uh, who, who could relate to the Woodhouse uh, genre of, of individual. Indians also developed not only a general sense of humour, but they had pride in their command of English, and they had an understanding of the type of exaggerated humour that Woodhouse liked to utilise. When he poked fun at a person or group from a particular country, and I don't mean India, uh, because I can only remember two references to India, the Indian would recognise that it was teasing humour. It wasn't malicious, it wasn't political, unlike some countries where an understanding of the subtleties of English doesn't come easily. This girl talks French with both hands. <laughs> and they can enjoy his barbed comments about stock English characters, such as the feckless young wastrel. As Egbert, from boyhood up, had shown no signs of possessing any intelligence whatsoever, a place had been found for him in the civil service. <laughs> <laughs> now, how, how might some of the plots be relevant to the developing Indian world experience? Well, I believe you, your country first held its elections in 1952. Readers would then have had plenty of time to understand the central plot mechanism which Woodhouse used in 1971 in a Jeeves and Worcester novel. The idea of a young friend of Bertie being persuaded against his will to stand for election to Parliament in the constituency of Market Snodsbury. He asked Bertie to help canvas. Bertie did so reluctantly, but enthusiastically not realising that he was spending several minutes on the doorstep of the opposing candidate, <laughs> telling her precisely why she should vote for his friend Ginger. It was Jeeves who eventually advised Ginger how he could guarantee not to be elected. And the following honest thoughts were included in his final election debate with his opponent. I wonder whether Shashi has ever made this sort of speech. <laughs> Listening to my opponent this evening has completely changed my political views. She has converted me to hers, and I propose, when the polls are opened, to cast my vote for her. I advise all of you to do the same. <laughs> now, more than a hundred years ago, Woodhouse wrote a poem about a by-election in the voice of a canvasser for one of the parties, who even after paying out more than five pounds in bribes to a voter, and that was five pounds of 1900 money, he was not sure how his interviewee would vote. A century later, I believe that that canvasser is working for, or even heading, an opinion poll organisation, <laughs> trying to forecast the result of our last general election or the recent US presidential election. <laughs> so in summary, uh, and I have had a, an opportunity of speaking to a number of Indians uh, in India, in the States, in the UK, in the Netherlands, I believe the popularity arose and can survive because of these factors. The ability to speak, read, <laughs> have a first-class understanding of English, which is key to getting a jo good job in India or abroad. The family circumstances of the Woodhouse reading educated Indian mirroring Woodhouse's characters in many ways. Servants, family retainers, headstrong aunts and uncles. The sympathy for the underdog. The humour with which he clothed his stories. Unique, but within the Indian ability to appreciate. The quantity and extent of Woodhouse's writing like that of Agatha Christie, meant that there were a lot of books for the generations to acquire, <coughs> read and pass down. And finally, with the development of other entertainment sources, the quality Indian authors that I mentioned, television, Bollywood, internet downloads, this represents a serious challenge to attract this, the current and the next generation to Woodhouse. Indians of both sexes and all ages are nevertheless represented well on Woodhouse websites, and societies, and the recent schools initiative, whereby Woodhouse will be included in the national cu uh, curriculum uh, for the next academic year, can only keep his fiction within the scope of the educated English-speaking Indian. Great, that was wonderful. Thank you, that is wonderful. Um, Shopman, do you want to take off on that? Yeah. Uh, I'll strike a little discordant note from Tony. I mean, first, I found this presentation quite unique in one sense, that probably it's the first time I've heard Woodhouse being cast as a person who believes in social equality 
and has a social conscience. As a person who has a particular, whose ire is directed against only the judges, only the magistrates, only the policemen, and a couple of others. Looking back, there may be various reasons why Indians read Wodehouse. But suddenly, that wasn't one of them. <laughs> now, who read Wodehouse in India? Was it one of those books which was sold at A.H. Wheeler or Higginbottom at the railway stations? Unlikely. Agatha Christie was. Arthur Conan Doyle is. But Woodhouse was a far more niche audience. I think it was one of the tragedies of our life that Shashi and I both went to the same college. <laughs> <laughs> Not a tragedy for me, Shabba. <laughs> uh, which, alas, had a Woodhouse society. Now, the unique thing about St. Stephen's in the 1970s, which I think Shashi will not disagree with me, was that 90% of those who read the liberal arts there came from exactly the same background. They'd more or less been to exactly the same type of schools. They had the same sort of parentage. And they spoke the same language. They were living in a make-believe world of their own a very comfortable world, a comfortable world which was also a very protected world, a protected world which was insulated from the rest of the great unwashed, as it were. And in that context, a Britain frozen in the 1930s or even before Edwardian, you could say, was something which was a great comfort. It was something we loved. We took a great amusement to, you know, the idea of the formidable aunts, whether it's Aunt Agatha, Mrs. Spencer Gregson, as she was, should have been known, uh, the blundering Lord Emsworth, Freddie Finknottle, uh, uh, Gussie, Gussie, Gussie Finknottle, with his newts, the school speech which he made. <laughs> <laughs> little tipsy. So these were the elements which appealed to us as people who also thought of ourselves as a little different. At St. Stephen's it was particular, and I mentioned St. Stephen's because it's the only place which had a Woodhouse Society. Shashi, you can correct me if there's any it was other. It's the only place in the world that had a Woodhouse Society. Okay, the only place. Why? <laughs> because we thought ourselves, we were in the university, but we were not part of it. We were in the campus, but we saw ourselves very different. There was a college across the road, which we never mentioned. <laughs> we called us, the people who lived in college were called gentlemen in residence. <laughs> they were not even hostel. I think so vulgar as that. It was the cafe, not some canteen. So it, in that sort of a world, Woodhouse fitted in beautifully. It didn't appeal. I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised Mehir said that in, it had a great appeal among the bong, the lefty bongs of uh, ISI. Of the because Shafan, you know no lefty bongs. <laughs> uh, he used to be one. Yeah. <laughs> anymore. <laughs> yes, perhaps anymore is the more uh, appropriate thing. Are there lefty bongs left? Uh, what is also quite interesting and I once asked Nirad Chaudhary, and you know, if, if you're talking about the last Englishman, I, I often <laughs> look, looked at Nirad Babu as really the epitome of the last Englishman. I said, have you ever read P.G. Woodhouse? <clears throat> he said, what's that? <laughs> he read the classics. But Woodhouse, nothing of the sort. Which, again, led me to one conclusion. The popularity of Woodhouse and this is actually confirmed, Tony, with your thing about Vikram Seth. We all come from a particular generation. We all come from a generation which is essentially post-independence, what people, um, Salman Rushdie calls the Midnight Children generation. And the appeal of Woodhouse was to a very limited period in time when between, I would say, it, it's, it's really about the mid-50s to about the late 70s or maybe the late, early 80s. That's really the period when India was a closed society, when India was far more class-ridden than anything else which was there, where it was really not a competitive society, 
where it was the ability to speak the English language, which was your greatest calling card. And that is something you valued. So there has to be a certain social context. And it's, it's, this is not to suggest that Woodhouse didn't entertain us. This is not to suggest that P.G. Woodhouse was one of our greatest delights. And that a lot of our approach to the English language actually stemmed from Woodhouse. Far more. I think the influence of Woodhouse in, every, in a lot of people have been really, I think it's something which has been underestimated. And I think I'm glad Vikram Seth, who actually comes from the same sort of background, you know, Dune Schools and Stephens, Oxford, that sort of thing. <laughs> Very predictable. Uh, and they were the people who loved him. And it's not surprising that today, and I went to Bari and Sons, which is one of the great con big con market bookshops in New Delhi, and asked, you know, does Woodhouse sell? He said, well, you know, occasionally we keep a few, but it's not, it's not something which sells very much. And I asked my son, who's about 25 and who's in his final year of law, I said, do you, have you ever read Woodhouse? He said, no, no. Do any of your friends read Woodhouse? No. It doesn't relate any longer. Because it was really in a particular social context. This is not to deny that that social context was very real at one time. And it was a very post-independence. It was not, Shashi's made a cottage industry out of anti-imperialism or something like that. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't share it. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a lovely thing, you know. Anti-imperialism, Woodhouse great. Uh, <laughs> Dichotomy, contradictions always appear. I mean, you know, very throw cool. in cricket as well, if you like. <laughs> cricket is an Indian game, Shashi. You should know that. Accidentally uh, invented by the British. Yeah, yeah. accidentally, completely. Uh, so it's, it's, it's quite heartening that, you know, when you look back at, uh, for those who want to relive, recreate that sort of India, which existed in the 1970s and 1980s, when there was one family ruling, and you know it was all very assured, and um, it's all very comfortable. We knew exactly our place in society: the rich man at the castle, the poor man at the gate. <laughs> uh, that's Woodhouse, and uh, it's good. It's a, it has a certain sociology, and it's very indicative that those who still celebrate him for a relevance, as opposed to being a, that of a writer, I think that tells a story of its own. Shashi, please ignore the bit about the one family and go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 think, I think I can see why this was set up so that I would follow <laughs> I actually was the, the chap who, the, with our society was founded before my time at St. Stephen's, but had gone defunct after just a couple of years. Um, so but actually founded in uh, 69 or 69, 70. and yeah. it was defunct by 71, or so we joined in 72, Chopin and I, and um, discovered that this precious legacy had been allowed to rot. So I proceeded with a gentleman called Jitin Shah Singh to revive the society, and in fact... Who was head boy of Dune School? <laughs> All right, sociology, <laughs> sociology apart. Um, we, uh, it became rapidly, and I think unarguably for a while, the most popular society in St. Stephen's College. We had an underground rag typed on, you know, encyclo-styled, whose misprints and, and, and mistypings were deliberate and deliberately hilarious. Uh, we had uh, the Lord Ickner Memorial Practical Joke Competition. <laughs> we also had assorted mimicry, speech contests, jokes of various sorts. And the society went on to become hugely successful until a last co-education dawned and the society got itself banned at some point for a practical joke contest that went awry and uh, featured, I believe, women's underwear flying at half-mast from the college chapel cross. <laughs> so this was not particularly appreciated. Uh, but nonetheless, the Woodhouse Society's heyday um, did, did, was, was memorable for all of us who were involved in it. I'm pleased to say that the English finally realized the wisdom of creating a Woodhouse Society, which they did after us, and, uh, and uh, Tony has been running it with such scholarship and aplomb. But I, all those personal elements apart, I do want to say that Chopin is, of course, completely wrong, because 
as usual, but, but in particular on this subject, because uh, Woodhouse is entirely compatible with anti-imperialism, or indeed with pro-imperialism, anything else, because the magic of the appeal of Woodhouse was precisely that it was so completely devoid of any obligation of allegiance to any ideology. The world he depicted didn't exist in England either. It was um, a world of, of carefully plotted entrances and exits, extremely complicated japes, wonderful humor, a tremendous sort of idyllic never-never land to which uh, Indians required no visa because you, had, you didn't have to understand any of the assumptions of real English life since the world he was depicting was really as unreal to any of the Englishmen reading him as it would have been to, um, to the Indians reading him. Uh, what was, however, interesting was that in many ways, Woodhouse's use of the English language was a particular delight to the anti-imperialists because it constantly took a relish in subverting all the precedents, all the classical illusions that joked about, all the, the, the sort of great phrases of Shakespeare and so on, which are turned upside down in quite hilarious ways. So all you needed, the only passport you needed to the Woodhouse world was the English language and an enjoyment of it. Uh, but because no allegiance to any political conviction or any appreciation of English life as it was really lived was required, it didn't require, uh, if you like, a visa. So you had the passport, you didn't need the visa, and you were able to enjoy that world for its, for its own sake. So when you, when you read about you know, uh, a character who looked nervous, <coughs> like Macbeth interviewing Lady Macbeth after one of her visits to the spare room, um, <laughs> or uh, uh, somebody saying he, he winced and groaned slightly, uh, like Prometheus after his vulture dropped in for lunch. You know, I mean, this kind of stuff, I mean, there is no politics here, there's just uh, brilliant uh, uh, prose style. And I think one of the interesting things for us uh, as readers, I, I would grant one point to Chopin, but not the other. I think Chopin is wrong about the books not being sold on the railway station platforms. I bought Woodhouse on rail railway station platforms. They were all over the place. In fact, uh, in the 80s no and 90s, I actually no read a study that said that, in, that Woodhouse was the best-selling English author, outselling Agatha Christie, Harold Robbins, John Grisham, all of those. Now, what's happened in the last 20 years or so, um, uh, and that's where I would agree with Chopin, is that basically reading of popular fiction has declined dramatically because those who read popular fiction are now instead getting their entertainment off television or the internet or handheld computer games or whatever else. What Chetan Bhagat, I mean, why? <laughs> He Chet sells by the bloody kilo. <laughs> he does. He does. But Chetan is appealing to a different kind of readership, one that, frankly, um, uh, whose vocabulary he would for you. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> they have Actually, to vote for Chetan, everything. Chetan, uh, uh, but Chetan's voters are exactly Shashi's voters. It's quite interesting. Mm. <laughs> but the language, however, that, that the, the knowledge of language he demands of them uh, is, not, is not there. Uh, is, it, they would not be able to appreciate what Woodhouse is doing. When Woodhouse says something like, you know, she resembled one of those portraits of mistresses of Bourbon kings, <laughs> which reminded you that these monarchs were men of iron, impervious to fire, to, to, to impervious to fear, or else short-sighted. <laughs> you know, and, and that, that entire sort of this, this pretense of lexical precision uh, coming up uh, in the end with, with a hilarious punchline, it was fabulous. I, I, I make absolutely no bones about the fact that I found his language as delightful as anything else. Very often I read the books for the language, for the ability to toss off these magnificent original similes one after the other. She had more curves than a scenic railway, for example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to play around with language, you know. If he wasn't disgruntled, he certainly wasn't very gruntled. And that's, that's another one. Um, or her face was shining like the seat of a bus driver's trousers. <laughs> you know, you can, you can go on and on with this. I remember uh, the late lament Christopher Hitchens, with whom I had a couple of celebrated uh, disagreements on other subjects. Uh, the first time we met we at the dining table, we spent the entire dinner uh, reciting our favorite Woodhouse lines to each other. And I think I won in the end, and won his, his heart in any case, by this one. Um, unlike the male codfish, which... <laughs> 
upon discovering that it is the parent of 3,500,000 little codfish, cheerfully resolves to love them all, the English aristocracy is apt to look with a somewhat jaundiced eye upon its younger sons. <laughs> and of course, they sent them off to India to boss over us, right? So, so now I do want to say that Tony mentioned that he'd come across two references to India in Woodhouse's books. I've only come across one, the one about Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, <laughs> uh, and you're saying, you know, that you know, the real problem in India is its inhabitants just eat a handful of rice, says one of the characters. If only Mahatma Gandhi sat down to a good steak, that book will be bad. <laughs> some roly-poly pudding and, and, some, and, 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 a, and, and a bite of Stilton afterwards, that will put an end to all this. The empire will tremble. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so this, this was the only reference. Is there another one? There is, and uh, much, much earlier, and uh, it, it was... Uh, a reference to, to the way that Jeeves came into a room, um, rather like the... Uh, the, the oh, the these astral bodies the astral disembodying bodies. themselves. Yes, yeah. I remember that. Yes. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not teasing Indians at all. It's That's right. He's like one of these Hindu um, sadhus yeah. who disassembles himself from one room and re-emerges in another. And, 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 and that was Jeeves. Yeah, and, and somebody said, I've tried it myself, and I nearly got there. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so, so, so to, to, to wrap it up, because I know we're already getting into the conversational part of this exchange, um, my argument would simply be, Woodhouse, um, uh, you didn't require to be the last Englishman uh, to, to like Woodhouse. In fact, literally the last official Englishman, Lord Mountbatten, was introduced to the works of Woodhouse by my former mother-in-law, a teenager whose father was an Indian nationalist politician and a state governor. And, and, uh, and it was not at all surprising that the nationalist uh, knew the works of Woodhouse, indeed had an entire collection. So not from the 1950s shop when you're going back to the 1920s and 30s with their collection. And, um, and, uh, and, and the last Viceroy of Britain had never heard of Woodhouse up to that point in 1948, I think it was, or 47, that, that he was given this. So, so the fact is that, um, the fact is that there is no, there is no uh, political allegiance at all required. Um, there is certainly a fondness for language. There is the delight in subverting all that you're supposed to venerate in that language. All the stuff that the English classes, and we've got Gauri Vishwanathan's scholarship telling us that the study of English literature was invented by the British in order to overawe the Indians. There was no study of English literature until they started teaching it in India. Um, they used to teach their, you know, the Greek and, and, and Latin classics. But English literature as a subject was created to teach us. Well, here you have Woodhouse subverting all of these greater, I mean, his book's full of, uh, of quotes without quotation marks, but, but gently subverted and turned around. Um, I think in many ways, um, uh, the, the delight that offered was wonderful. And you could actually relish the pleasure of a world of enchantment that the English language undoubtedly had opened you to, without any of the anxiety of political allegiance that, that um, other works of, of British, of English literature might have brought in its, uh, brought in its wake. And therefore, to my mind, um, they, it had nothing to do with admiring the English, nothing to do with respect for the British Raj. Indeed, many of the readers of Woodhouse, including myself, the cottage industry man, uh, um, uh, uh, may detest the Raj in all its works, but love Woodhouse. And I think that, above all, why he will endure, though increasingly, Chopin may be right, in a niche uh, market in India, is because of these factors. I think, frankly, a lot of reading is becoming uh, niche pretty much everywhere. I mean, how many of us in the last five years have read a book published before 1970? Um, I mean, if you think really hard, you, you'll find it, I think, very, very little. First of all, there's a lot out there that's more, more recently available. Uh, and um, and the, the number of choices, if you're reading, if you've got less time to read and more books available to choose from, inevitably the older ones do get left behind. Mm -hmm. But I think that Woodhouse will stay in print, will stay available. As recently as about 10 years ago, the person running the British Council Libraries in India said that they ordered more copies of Woodhouse books. Now, Chopin may be right about the sociology of those who borrowed books from the British Council Libraries, but they ordered more Woodhouse books than those of any other author. Um, and they would order five copies of one because of our book borrowing culture. Uh, otherwise, the queues for, for borrowing a Woodhouse would still be too long. So I don't think Woodhouse is going to die out, and I think that basically is where I would rest my case.
<laughs> well, thank you all three. I was concerned that there was going to be no disagreement, um, which was, as usual, fruitless. Uh, but um, I sort of wanted to take, uh, 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 take off from this uh, part about relevance. Um, as a matter of fact, before I was uh, 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 before I, I, I arrived in London, I, I called and I asked uh, um, Penguin uh, how their Woodhouse books were doing, and I was uh, I was I sort of hoping for a, lo a large spreadsheet, but uh, I it uh, I was returned the single word robust. Mm. So, um, which I assume means this is the Indian penguin or the British penguin? Uh, Indian penguin. So it it continues to be uh, to do reasonably well. Uh, they haven't seen a falling off in the past 10 or 15 years as okay. such. Um, there are still people reading it. Um, but the question that I sort of had was, and I think that we may have touched on the, uh, the answer already in some sense, but I want to make it explicit. Why hasn't Woodhouse taken to translation or even adaptation? Um, Shashi, you pointed out that there was Idhar Udhar, or whatever it was called. This Leave it to Smith uh, in Durdarshan yes. in 1988. Which had some lovely bits, including, you know, Saeed Jaffrey as uh, Joseph Kibo, uh, who's trying to steal his wife's necklace, constantly sort of, you know, having twitchy fingers when she wears it. And uh, so there were lovely bits in it, but it never really took off. And I wanted to ask all three of you why you feel translation is difficult. And you in particular, Tony, if there are languages or cultures where Woodhouse in translation has done better than in English. I, I think it's translation into drama, which is the big problem uh, for television, for film, and even for um, the theatre. Because Woodhouse was uh, a writer of narrative as well as dialogue. And the, it's very, very difficult to get narrative into your uh, plays. The recent two series of Blandings uh, on UK television, in, in audience terms, they did very, very well, much better than expected. But the Woodhousian objected because uh, liberties had been taken in exactly the same way as liberties had been taken with the Leave It to Smith when it was translated into Hindi, moved to Rajasthan. Um, and uh, I, I did see one report which said that the most reliable character in that was uh, Baxter, who was put across as uh, uh, a stubborn, a typical stubborn Indian bureaucrat. Um, and, and that reminded me of uh, one of Woodhouse's wonderful quotes about uh, French bureaucrats who were capable of causing more pain uh, with, uh, with their activities than the bureaucrats of six other countries put together. <laughs> uh, so I, I think we, we had that. We, we've had uh, the Leave it to Smith there. Um, you contrast that with uh, the, the, the recent uh, play that's been going around um, by the Goodale brothers, the, the, the translation of um, uh, Code of the Worcesters, Perfect Nonsense. It had a year in London. Uh, it, it, had, it won the Olivier Award for comedy. Uh, it, it had an, an, an Bertie playing the narrator as well as the character. And when it came to India last year, it's been to, I think, three cities initially, um, it, it did very well and it filled the houses and uh, everybody seems to have enjoyed it. And I rather get the feeling that the Chief Justice of Madras will still be dining out on the, uh, on the, on the story of how he was sitting in the front row and Bertie Worcester chucked the policeman's helmet in his lap. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite uh, entertaining. But, but uh, Chopin, do, do, you think that, uh, do you think there's something about the English that can't be translated into to choose an example at random of a, of a very difficult language, Bengali? You know, uh, I think Woodhouse got a certain additional boost in India, partly because of Stephen Fry. And when the, uh, that Woodhouse Playhouse, the, the, the television series, it, it was enormously popular. And just as most English uh, television serials tend to be very popular in, in India, I mean, the, um, the Poiro one was you know, spectacularly popular. And so there is a certain image of England. Nobody calls it Britain or the United Kingdom. I mean, I've heard of the word United Kingdom in India. There's still, it's Britain or England. And there is a certain image of England which corresponds to a certain caricature. It's a stereotype. And what else fits that? And I would think it's really near impossible that this can actually be translated in any sort of way into, you know, the, the, the idiom is so unique. 
and it's located very much in a particular social context of this country. And I don't think it uh, really lends itself to any meaningful translation. In fact, I was just reminded that in the, the, the Second World War, the Germans, thinking wrongly like some others that Woodhouse represented the quintessential English, uh, trained some spies they were dropping into England uh, by, by making them read Woodhouse. And, they just, and the moment these fellows were parachuted in, apparently they were arrested within five minutes because they're all wearing spats. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so uh, yeah, it, it really is this other way. I think if, it have a, if you had a very clever... Actually, if that's not true, I want it to be true. It so is that. true, it is true. <laughs> it is true, I've read it from a very reliable source. And in fact, the thing is that um, if, um, if these translations, I'd love to know this Telugu translation was a bestseller. He's taken a number of Mulliner stories. Hmm. And I imagine that what he's done is he's judged those stories which can translate well, where the language is not necessarily the key thing. But some of the examples I've mentioned or Tony read out in his remarks, I don't see how they'd work in any other language half as well, because it's precisely the music of the language as well and the, the abrupt um, sort of surprise at the end of the sentence and so on that makes it so funny. Um, anyway, to cut a long story short, I just don't know the answer to Mihir's question, do you? I, I would just make the comment that th there are new translations being worked on all the time. Um, Finland are looking for some more at the moment, as you would expect. Well, I was in Finnish. Well, why not? Um, th th there are new French ones in, in the pipeline. Uh, next year, no, next month, sorry, the first Chinese, um, simplified Chinese, uh, will be out. Uh, oh, no. One of the Jeeves stories. That's the point at which, yes, we'll have to give up on this. You know, they will have a, a flourishing Woodhouse industry within six months. <laughs> <laughs> no, but is, is, are there any instances of Woodhouse actually being borderized? Like having... Oh, yes. You know, because I, I noticed this, but I'm a great fan of the Billy Bunter books. And the original oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. they Bunter. cut out... Uh, you know, they've cut Maharaja out a lot of things. Uh, uh, Maharaja Hari Jamset Ram Singh, yes, known as well, Inky. Inky. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of wily leg spin bowler is now <laughs> presented as someone who talks normal. <laughs> it doesn't of talk like the that, wonderfulness the babu, is indeed uh, terrific. Yeah. So whether, whether that sort of thing is going to be done to... Uh, they've done it to Woodhouse as well. You know. I mean, to Blyton as well. I wonder if they've done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Anyway, mm. Uh, before we sort of throw it open to questions, which I want to get to because we have a few minutes left. One last question. Um, has any of you... Um, and uh, each one of you, please answer. Tried and uh, at some point to sound like P.G. Woodhouse, it, <laughs> either while talking or while writing. Well, I've, I've, I've written a short story overtly, sort of as a tribute to Woodhouse, and set in Calcutta. Uh, 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 it, it's it's called How Bobby Chatterjee Turned to Drink, <laughs> and it's modelled very much on uh, Woodhouse story with my attempt at Woodhousian similes and bunji. Anyone interested uh, can find it in my collection, The Five Dollar Smile and Other Stories. I thought it's... we were going to get through this one without Shashi mentioning it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you asked for it. You asked for it. <laughs> so I have. So uh, I just did it once for the hell of it, and, and, and lots of friends liked it. But I mean, the fact is that you can't, no one can write like Woodhouse. No one can. There's this, uh, there was this attempted Jeeves novel by Sebastian Fox, wasn't it? Or somebody? Yes, yes, it was Sebastian um, Which was modest. Which I reviewed, <laughs> which I reviewed as, a, as a Woodhousean review. So yeah, everyone's tried. Uh, Tony? Uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, Sir Edward Cazalet is Woodhouse's uh, son-in-law. He was... Uh, um, a, a senior judge in the, in the courts here. And he was asked by the Inner Temple to prepare a series of uh, articles for the Inner Temple yearbook uh, about aspects of Woodhouse's life. And, and he, he asked me if I could help him by giving some ideas. And, and what I tried to do was to do an introduction in a semi-Woodhousean style. And I, I believe that most people who have any idea about writing at all can do a very accurate Woodhousian uh, summary for about 200 words. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then it gets very, very difficult indeed. And that's why Sebastian Fuchs didn't try to do Woodhousian. He knew it couldn't be done. Um, but he made a very uh, gallant attempt to bring people back to Woodhouse. And he was very forthright and said, go and read your Woodhouse. I'm just reminding you that it's there. And that's what he did. And he, he, he did have a very significant boost in the, uh, the sales of, of Woodhouse, not just the Jeeves, but the other stories as well, um, in, in those uh, immediate po post folks' years. 
<laughs> well, the cultivated stutter is something you come across all the time in this country. Uh, you come across a lot of people who still talk like Lord Emsworth in their sheer, you know, absent-mindedness. Oh, breakfast, yes, uh, breakfast. Ah, oh, certainly <laughs> breakfast. Di sort of Diane Abbott was one, I think. <laughs> Diane Abbott was one. <laughs> Diane Abbott. <laughs> uh, unwittingly, perhaps. <laughs> Diane Abbott. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to... You know, it's election time, so let's not get into it. Uh, I don't know about... How they sound, at least there are a lot of people in India who attempt to sound like Wood, Woodhouse. Mm. There was a person who was in the college across the road, Shashi Maitramo, you remember, uh, uh, who attempted often, and we often wondered what's the genesis of it. And we were told that, well, his grandfather once flew over Germany, which is why he sounds a bit English. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very Stephanian, as a put down. <laughs> Anyway, well, wonderful. Let me let me sort of um, uh, ask uh, any, anyone with any qu questions, quotations. Uh, the gentleman in the front row. Uh, I, I think there may have been a risk of slightly overthinking this, but I just want to know what did dear old Plum think of the fact that we're sitting here discussing the sociology of his works? He would be absolutely staggered. Um, <laughs> Uh, Edward, Edward Caslett has made this point to a lot of audiences in, in various places. He, he, he has said that he would be s sitting up there, smile on his face, utterly bemused. Um, there's a lady in the front. I grew up with Woodhouse in French. And uh, although it's, of course, almost impossible to... to, to reproduce the gruntled and disgruntled uh, <laughs> uh, word on, on, on vocabulary. The, the rhythm is, is really what makes a lot of the language, and that is reproducible and it's delightful. But to come back to your remark about... Do you remember that wonderful line about that, uh, what is it, that, that, that guilty, furtive look that comes across an Englishman's face. No, that, that immediately signals oh, yes. that an Englishman is about to yeah. speak French. That hangdog, hangdog, <laughs> hangdog furtive, furtive look. look. <laughs> But to come back about, um, to your remark about the no visa uh, access to Woodhouse, wouldn't you say that the visa is actually the knowledge of Macbeth and the knowledge of, of uh, so that's the your classics? That's the possible. And that is, yes. And is, is that what would be missing from a future generation of uh, Woodhouse readers? Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a good question because the fact is that. Um, um, the passport was English language. It's very interesting that, you know, say a century ago, um, if it were possible, of course, it wasn't for other reasons, but let's say it were possible for an Indian to show up in the UK, in, in Britain, as Shopford says, and have a conversation about culture, literature, whatever, they would, he would have exactly the same frame of reference available to him as the English person he was encountering. Today, there'd be different television shows, there'd be different cinema, there'd be different theater, there'd be uh, even different books uh, that are not crossing the waters to the Indian bookshops that the person in England would have read. So the gulf is much greater. Uh, the, the canon, however, the established works of English literature that, that everyone is supposed to study, hasn't yet changed colossally. It may, it, it may well be on the way to changing. But so anybody who's studied English on what we call in India an English medium school will still be familiar with the, the great plays of Shakespeare. No, and some no, no. that's not true, Sashi. Not anymore? anymore? Not, at, not at all. I don't know. There's been a complete massacre of what passes off as the English language now in India. And I think ever since, they, ever since the Inglit pundits decided that sort of dead white males are not worth you know, studying. There's been a considerable... No, that's at the down. university no, no, level, been a not at the school level. Down, whereby right. I don't think there are any schools which at the school level actually make you read a complete play of Shakespeare, which we were obliged to do. I think, Several. Uh, I think some ICSC ones still do. Very, yeah. very. ICSC schools too. Yeah. Well, you know, exactly. I have to say in response to this, uh, um, uh, oddly enough, you don't always need to know. Uh, uh, in, in some cases, as in mine, I had never read, I think it was uh, um, 
a winter's tale, I can't remember which one, uh, you know, patience, whichever one patience and a monument is from, mm. all right? Or, you know, the, a, a lot of the quotations from Shakespeare, the Book of Common Prayer, whatever that, that Woodhouse was sort of drop into, uh, uh, into conversation. Patience and a monument is Twelfth Night. Twelfth Night, that's right, Twelfth Night. Uh, um, uh, you know, you, you, you only actually saw them first in Woodhouse, and then when you read, you know, four years or five years later, you came across the place, like, ah, that's where it's from. And it didn't really stop you from um, enjoying it. You knew that he was, he was doing something that had a reference somewhere, and you enjoyed it because you could tell he was sort of playing with the, uh, playing with the reference. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so the next question, please. Uh, the, the gentleman in the blue uh, shirt on, in the fourth row. On a slightly different tack, um, what would uh, would have say to you, Shashi, about um, the idea that uh, we can't give up on what we started in terms of, um, um, I was thinking like on a global thing, global level, of uh, being Secretary General of the UN and seeing how we could, uh, if not yourself, but someone you could encourage uh, to uh, progress in the line that uh, you took up <laughs> and uh, see if it's possible to Thank you. Uh, bring that forward. A couple, couple more questions we'll collect. Uh, another gentleman in a blue shirt, really people. Um, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, does this work? Yeah, Mr. Ring, I can confirm that there is definitely a few translations of Woodhouse in Bengali. Uh, a couple of Jeeves novels, at least one Emsworth, brought out by publisher in Dhaka, so it might be worth your while to look them up. I can't, you know, vouch for the, uh, you know, whether the verbal fireworks translate well, but they seem to be quite popular. They have quite a few readers. Thank okay. you. And um, we'll just come back to, we'll collect a few more because we're running out of time. Um, someone at the back, uh, the gentleman right at the back. This guy at the front row has been trying. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a, for a wonderful, most enjoyable talk. The, the Woodhouse quote that's most often referred to in my family is that moment when aunt starts calling to aunt, no. like mastodons primeval bellowing in a primeval, primeval swamp, swamp, which, uh, which uh, all too often can, can, can happen. But I had a slightly more serious question as well, which was given that, that in the UK, conversation about Woodhouse is often centred around the controversy over the wartime broadcasts and those have been very misunderstood, but also discussed a great deal. Has that ever been an issue in India in its consideration of, of Woodhouse as well? No, because in fact, it actually confirms the point I'm making. That Woodhouse was so completely innocent of any political sense, frankly, whether about imperialism in India on the one hand or about what the Nazis were up to. I mean, he, he probably thought it was a fun thing to do to make broadcasts and reassure all his friends and readers around the world that he was alive and well and taking the mickey gently out of the Germans. He, I don't think he had the slightest sense that this, uh, these broadcasts, the very fact of these broadcasts, would be um, seen as collaborating with the enemy. He was interned. He was a, a prisoner, basically. And, and uh, they said, if you want, you can broadcast. And he said, fine. He, he was actually quite quite uh, uh, witty about, uh, about his German custodians. But no one listened to the content, right? It was just, and don't forget, this was also the same time as Lord Ho Ho and these other characters who were actually beaming pro-Nazi propaganda in English, and Woodhouse was assimilated with all of them. But as you know, in, uh, he was thoroughly investigated after the war, and uh, the, of the intelligence officer who was asked to investigate this became afterwards one of his biggest friends and admirers and, and published a couple of books about, uh, about Woodhouse. I, I just want to make two things. I mean, Woodhouse, uh, basically, I think he stayed back because of his dogs. Hmm. Yeah. Essentially. <laughs> I mean, that's something which we must remember. Quite right. I mean, love. And what could be more English? <laughs> and number two, which side was India during the war? <laughs> yes. Which side was India during the war? I leave that as a very difficult opening. question for a Bengali. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 think, I think one other point that, that uh, was relevant was that when the broadcasts were made, they were made to the US, basically to the readers of the Saturday Evening Post, and the US was not in the war. Mm. Um, just one, one last question. It, it's a, a, a statement, actually, or a comment that when you said that the translation part of it, uh, there is a major e effect of Woodhouse in Bengali literature, for example, and I can think of at least three writers 
who write very who wrote very much in the similar vein, like Shibram Chakraborty, uh, mm. Tarapodo Rai, uh, Shonjib Chatterjee, and they all write very much in the Woodhouse style, and they have Fair enough, characters. Yeah, their wordplay is yeah, yeah. similar. So yeah. that's a good effect. Yeah. Yeah. True. Um, Tony, uh, there, uh, there was a question for you, I think, earlier. Well, I think it was just a, a comment. I, I'm delighted to hear that there was some uh, Bengali uh, literature, and I, I shall do my best to find them. <laughs> right. Um, anything else? Because we are I didn't fully get the question about the UN, to be very honest. I, and I'm going to ask you, you hadn't got it either. So, um, um, But broadly speaking, I, 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 I honestly don't think Woodhouse would have had much to do with the UN either way. <laughs> I don't think, even though it existed, obviously, for many years, where well, he died in 1974, he never, mentioned, he never mentioned the United Nations. He, uh, the, 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 uh, how bad Woodhouse was about politics and this kind of thing, I think, is most visible in Aan Sant Gentleman, which is, I think, the second last thing that he wrote. Uh, where he uh, where he sort of almost shoehorned Bertie uh, uh, running into an anti-Vietnam war rally and observing somebody at an anti and, and that that felt so wrong. Yeah. Uh, that but except Woodhouse so did when you read it. There. Woodhouse did go after the fascists when Oswald Mosley was at his peak. Exactly. But as we know, Rod fascists, Roderick Spode was kind Roderick of Mosley. As we know, yeah. fascists are timeless and come in many different sort of variants. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, one last question, and then we must move on. Hi, I just wanted to ask, um, how important do you think it is to kind of decolonize our reading in India? Because um, I think it's great that, like, Woodhouse is so great, blah, 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 but... Um, <laughs> like, the gentleman over there mentioned that there are some great Bengali writers who do similar things. Like, is it, do you think it's just kind of the residues and the remnants of colonialism that mean that we prioritize reading these white males, as opposed to appreciating what our own country can produce and do. All right, so I, well, can, I can in fact um, tell you what Shashi will say, and I can tell you no, what... No, but I really, I want to hear what he has to say. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 I can ventriloquize this, you know? <laughs> I, I can speak swap, swap with uh, uh, Shashi and Shopan with both hands, as they say on this one. Uh, but yes, and... and, and um, no, but uh, allow, allow me nonetheless to... Tell you what Mir thinks I might say, which, which is that actually it's, it's more an issue of language. I'm afraid there, is, um, uh, there are Indians who could read Woodhouse in English and can't read Tarapodaroi in Bengali. There are certainly Indians who can do both, and I hope they will. Uh, but my point is, of course, that we must decolonize our minds, and I've been advocating for some time that we should both continue to read Shakespeare and read Kalidasa, and if English is our language, there are excellent translations of Kalidasa in English for us to be conscious of what has been written and the extraordinary quality of that. The same with our epics, which I've read in English. I've read vast quantities of Hindu uh, spiritual writings in English translations, and they're very competent ones there. And if you find their un uneven incompetence, read more than one translation of the same thing, you'll get a sense of broadly what it's all about. So I think that if language is a vehicle, it's not a destination. I happen to grow up with English as my first language, the language in which I went to school, but not just in the classroom, it was the language of the playground, the language of, my, of, my, of the notes one passed to one's friends surreptitiously behind the teacher's back, the language in which one wooed one's girlfriends, all of that. So it was a natural living language, and it was therefore the natural language in which to read for pleasure as well as for education. And we'll end with Rachel. Yeah, I, yes, I have, I have that if, it depends what you mean by decolonizing the mind or decolonization. If you mean replacement of a certain body of literature with what is to, to, today being paraded as political correctness and this post-structuralist, modernist, and all that sort of thing. I wish we don't decolonize ever. I really believe that under the guise of decolonization, we have assaulted the intellectual traditions of our country. Because the Indian mind was only truly colonized after the independence, mm. in my view. It was not That's really the problem we'll have during independence. Because I the told you. <laughs> because, <laughs> because the teaching of Sanskrit, for instance, most Indians came out of you know, school with a certain fluency in all Indian languages. And Arabic and Persian. And classical Indian languages and classical languages. They may not have been able to speak English very well, but they certainly had a certain command over written English. Now, what we, what we did in that sort of 
gray area between the 1950s and 1970s was that we lost sight of that. And today we are trying to recover some of it. It's not a question of one government alone. Various governments have tried it. But if you want to replace it with a series of dogmatic assertions which calls for decolonization, I hope that will never come about. There is a body of literature. I was told in my old university, SOAS, they don't want to teach Western philosophy any longer. I think not it's true. Complete, whatever it is, you know. <laughs> I'm a professor right. there. We yeah. teach Indian philosophy. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, I'm just going to make my last comment with it. It was lovely to have this talk on Woodhouse. It was nice that you all wore blue. It was nice to have a proper manal here, I think. No women allowed on this panel to make uh -uh. another <laughs> objection to this. And is this... <laughs> and is this because P.G. Woodhouse p appeals to a particular kind of male who finds women formidable and intimidating? Let Thank you. I, 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 I don't know... And we will leave it at that. I don't know about formidable and intimidating, but I can tell you about Woodhouse writing about the, the American who married young and kept on marrying, leaping from blonde to blonde like the chamois of the Alps, leaping from crag to crag. <laughs> so you see, we just uh, needed one or two of them on stage. Well, uh, please Thank join you. me in thanking our sponsors, Z Entertainment, and of course, all of our speakers today. Uh, Shashi will be available for book signing in the entrance hall of the library and lots of his books will be available for sale as well. Thank you.